Hi there everyone, I'm John and welcome to this week's Cool Smartphone Podcast. And joining me on tonight's podcast, we have Gary. Hi Gary. Hello. And Matteo. Hi Matteo. Good evening. Hi, thanks for having me back on the show. Absolute pleasure. And I suspect tonight we'll be talking about a lot of devices. And to start us off with, yesterday, Motorola held a launch event. And, Matteo, you were there, weren't you? I was. So I was in London, and I had the brewery where Motorola were holding their launch event for, well, they didn't say what it was for, but it turned out to be for three devices, which was a big surprise for us all. Where would you like me to start? Why don't we start with the actual experience of the event itself? We were let into the brewery after a small waiting in a, an artificial garden in a courtyard in the complex. And then they had a completely motorola out uh, venue. So great lighting, obviously optimised for HDR-like photography with strong colours. We had uh, a bar area at the back uh, where they were serving drinks. And then at the front, an auditorium area with three very large screens, a small lectern, and space for speakers. Now, I was attending the London event. Uh, At exactly the same time, Motorola had two concurrent events, one in Sao Paulo in Brazil and one in New York in the USA. So together with London, the three events were linked. Motorola had top brass executives at each location, and they shared out the launch of their products. So the launch of the products started off with a preamble about how awesome Motorola are and how well they're doing. They moved on to then announce that they were very exciting news, and they started off by announcing the Motorola Moto X style, uh, which is their real flagship for 2015. So for those of you who don't know, the Motorola Moto X launched in 2013 as a flagship phone, even though on the spec sheet it was not a flagship. It had a flagship-like experience in a very nice new hardware design language, and the Moto X had very good reviews. So the Moto X was the flagship. Uh, In 2014, they updated it. It was essentially a a mini Nexus 6, or the Nexus 6 was a maxi Moto X in terms of hardware. With this year, uh, Motorola have the Moto X style, which is a 5.7-inch device. So considerably bigger than last year's Moto X, which was a 5.2-inch one. So the screen is lovely. It's a 5.7-inch one. Uh, It is a capital QHD, so 560, which keeps all the pixel density enthusiasts very, very happy on Android 5.1.1. It has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 808 hexa-core, and there are the three variants, 1632 and 64 gigabytes of storage. All three models are coupled with 3 gig of RAM. And this year, the device, the, the Moto X style, is expandable with microSD, which is a very welcome addition to, to the feature set. The build quality and the customization with Moto Maker, the online service Motorola office offers. The Moto X style uh, has a few new improved experiences, particularly with regards to cameras, and we can talk about that later. But it is essentially it's a 21 megapixel camera, which is supposed to be excellent in low light. It has dual LED, dual tone flash, and records video in 4K wide, 2K high and a 5 megapixel selfie camera. So this is a, a flagship. It's not an octa-core Snapdragon 8, it's a hexa-core one, and that improves battery life drastically. So the Moto X style, 5.7-inch device, it's a phablet, but it's very, very handleable. So it has very high screen-to-body ratio. So it's a lot of screen, very little bezel, and compared side-by-side side with my Nexus 6, it's much, much more handleable. So it feels much easier to use to type on uh, compared to the Nexus 6, despite being almost Nexus 6 size. So do you have any questions on that, guys? No, I, I'm pretty good. Uh, I saw the hands-on you did yesterday in the uh, excellent live blog. 
I'm more intrigued by the Moto X Play. Yes, so the, the Moto X Play was the second device they launched. So the Moto X Play is making a... Well, excuse the pun. The Moto X Play is making a play for the mid-range segment of the market. Whereas the Moto X Style is stylishly taking the high-end flagships on, Moto X Play is going after the mid-range and it packs quite a nice feature set itself. So it's a 5.5-inch screen, slightly smaller than the Moto X style, but same uh, design language, very, very nice to handle. It has a 1080 Full HD screen, so obviously lower resolution than the Moto X style, but that then kicks into the battery life. And that's one of the main features of the Google Moto X play because the battery in this thing is huge so it's declared as a 3630 milliamp battery which is a whole 630 milliamps more than the Moto X style which has a bigger body it is thicker and heavier but the battery life on this thing is supposed to be very good there are two storage options so there's 16 and 32 gigabytes of sto- internal storage, also expandable via microSD. The device has 2 gigabytes of RAM and a 21 megapixel camera, which is much the same as the one on the Moto X style. There are a few differences with regards to what the camera can do, though. So the Moto X style, the big flagship one, is powered by the Snapdragon 808 chip. What Motorola have done with the Moto X Play is put in a Snapdragon 615, so it's a mid-range chipset, which has quad-core Cortex-A53 running at 1.7 GHz, and it has a quad-core 1 GHz chipset, which means that it is octa-core, so more cores, but they are less capable than the Snapdragon 808 combination of 2 plus 4. So it's a mid-range chipset, and that affects how the camera performs and the fact that it can't take as high-resolution video, and it takes it has some slight differences in software and how it handles low light and some of the cool software features that Motorola have been working on. So Moto X Play, mid-range device, slightly lower-end processor, massive battery, very nice to handle, much easier than even in the Moto X style. Uh, I would say it was a very good all-rounder. I didn't notice any lag. I did a bit of stress testing. It's a good device. And just like the Moto X style, there will be motor maker options for uh, ordering your Moto X Play. So, yeah, that's that's about it. Thoroughly enjoyed playing around with them. Uh, the design language, if you've played around with Motorola's uh, devices from the past couple of years, is very, very similar. This time they have a new material, both the X-Style and the Moto X-Play have a new silicon material, which is supposed to discolor and wear and tear much better. So it should discolor less and it should be more resistant to everyday life. So the, the Moto Maker option, how much of a big thing is that? Um, I would say it's a big thing in that in the hands-on area of the event... It had equal space, if not slightly more, than the handsets and the other features. So they had a section with, funnily enough, Lenovo Yoga laptops in uh, tent mode. So you could use the touchscreen, play around with the Moto Maker, customize your devices, and see the end result on screen. So that was a very big thing. So that's Big Play Motorola have been making relatively quietly in the last few years. I think this is going to be a bigger thing in the short term. Also because the Moto Maker isn't just available in the Moto X style and the Moto X Play. It's also uh, going to be available as with the Motorola Moto G third generation, which was also uh, announced at the event. So the Moto G third generation is uh, an iteration of the Moto G, where they've kept the size and much of the body features of the second generation Moto G but they've changed the design language on the back to be very similar to the Moto X Play and the Moto X style Uh, the device is now 
completely waterproof. So it's IPX7 rated. That means that it can be underwater up to one meter for up to 30 minutes. And you can then take it out, shake off the water, and carry on using your phone. So the Moto G takes on that new 64-bit chipset. This is, again, a Qualcomm chipset. Uh, but in this case, it's running on a quad-core set of A53 chips. It's the Snapdragon 410. And with the Moto G, this time they're spicing up the options in terms of memory. So whereas previously all Moto Gs had one gigabyte of RAM, uh, now the one gigabyte of RAM is only coupled with eight gigabytes of storage. If you go for the 16 gigabyte version, that has two gigabytes of RAM, which will essentially put to bed the people who are complaining about there being only one gig of RAM on the on the second generation Moto G. Now, the storage, 8 or 16 gigabytes, is what's built in. And as with the second generation Moto G and the first generation Moto G in its 4G LTE variant, has micro SD expansion. So that can take up to 32 gigabytes. Now, obviously... I know that this up to thing is something that the manufacturer says. Uh, I was, as part of attending the event, was given a Moto G uh, third generation, and I've actually popped in a 64 gigabyte card, which does mount. I haven't loaded much data on it yet, but it does mount, which is a good start. And in terms of the camera, uh, the Moto G has been improved drastically over the previous version. So last in, in the, its last iteration, the second generation one, Motorola put in 8 megapixel camera, if I'm not mistaken. This year they've bumped it up to 13 megapixel camera. It's the same sensor that was in the, Moto, uh, in the Motorola manufactured Nexus 6 last year without image stabilization. And that brings me to, let's put it this way, the spec sheet disappointments that... All three devices that Motorola announced yesterday do not have optical image stabilizations in the camera. Having said that, uh, the softer refinements they've made and how Motorola have tuned the cameras makes the need for optical image stabilization be smaller. But all in all, uh, they've picked up their cameras, and especially in the Moto G, it makes a big difference. So I've been using this for about a day now, and I'm really impressed by the 13 megapixel sensor in the new Moto G. Sounds uh, good. So I'd say Motorola have another winner on their hands. Uh, how well it will do, only time will tell. Does the Moto Maker option affect the waterproofing at all? Uh, no, it doesn't. So with regards to the Moto G, uh, the Moto Maker options, while still being wide, are more limited in the materials you can choose from. So the back panels, which are removable, uh, even if the device is waterproof, the back panels are all the silicon, whereas in the Moto X Play and the Moto X Style, uh, the premium materials are only available on those two devices. They're not available on the Moto G. So we've seen uh, the, the price for the Moto G that has been made available because it's, uh, as you said, it is now available um, from three. Have we had any in indication of prices for the Moto X Play or style? Right. Um, this is this was an interesting point. So a lot of the people at the event from Motorola were not from the UK market, so they couldn't confirm UK pricing. Off the record, uh, I did speak to the famous people close to the matter, or in the know, and uh, those people uh, were giving me pricing of the Moto X style, so the flagship, in the three to four hundred pound price range, closer to the four hundred pound uh, price point. That's including the AT. And the Moto X Play Edition being in the two to three hundred pound price range, closer to three hundred. It obviously is variable depending on the customization levels. So 
obviously if you go for the wooden backs and uh, the premium materials and also want engraving on the back, you will be paying slightly more for that. Of course. But it should all be within under the £300 for the Moto X Play, under £400 for the Moto X Style, and with regards to the Moto G, I believe it's 169 or 179 uh, for the basic model. If you want to start uh, playing around with the Moto Maker, it can go up to £200, which is still good value for money if compared to its direct competitors in the market with similar specs. I, I actually saw one of those uh, direct competitors, or I saw um, information about one of the direct competitors today um, in the updated version of the Desire 620, uh, the Desire 626. Um, and needless to say, um, I think HTC were slightly concerned when Moto announced their specs yesterday because they equal or better everything on the 626 with the Moto G. Yes, uh, definitely the thing. So I, I think it's ultimately a, a big product, product strategy decision. So HTC have a good product, um, but they have spent considerable amount, a considerable amount of time and effort in working on the Sense skin for uh, their devices, and as well as having to tune the hardware and software for the the devices. Whereas Motorola have essentially taken their foot off the pedal in terms of user interface and things, they're quite happy with Google's design language, and it's practically untouched. I believe the only difference I've noticed are the camera icon and the messaging icon. Everything else is practically identical to Google stuff, uh, and if there are any optimizations, they're done at a low level where Motorola have full control over it. Whereas I have a feeling that HTC have to still go back to suppliers to get help with updating the software. And that will be what ultimately causes HTC delays in getting that out. The point that Motorola is selling a much larger volume of devices means that they have economies of scale. They can produce more at a lower cost and pass those savings on. So, so where do you think um, Motorola sit in the league table of, of phone manufacturers in in terms of sales and influ, influence? So if, if we see we've got Apple at the top, whereabouts do, do they fit in there? Right. Um, that's a question that's dangerous to answer, John. So when you're talking about markets for phones, you can't really make a sweet, sweeping statement like that. Oh, I think I just did. Yes, you did. Uh, but in my view, you have to look at it as, to the average consumer, which is the majority of consumers of these devices, um, these are appliances, close in, in terms close to being toasters. They have to switch on, they have to work, they have to do a job. And depending on the markets and the customers you're aiming them at, um, in different categories, there are different winners. And in the mid and low ends, Motorola have been killing it in Western markets in the last few years. Apple have held on to the sort of premium segment with a few forays from other uh, manufacturers. But I'd say the closest Apple has to compete with Motorola's product lineup is the iPhone 5C at the moment. So we're talking at essentially a two, two-and-a-half-year-old Apple iPhone design and product in a shiny plastic casing. And that's still almost double the price of the Moto G, with no expansion options, no real added value. So it's, it's difficult to make a, a statement like that. Motorola dominates that mid to low end of the market in Western in some Western Europe markets. So I didn't answer your question, 
No, let me put my question a bit more context. In my perception, we've had Apple at the top of the market generally in terms of pure reputation of making nice devices with, with the average customer for a long time. And with at uh, one point, Motorola was almost, in my perception, a non-player up until the point when, when Google bought them. In the meantime, we've, we've had Samsung gain massive market share. And then now it appears to me that the bubble has burst and their market share is, is slowing down or going backwards. And we've got HTC, who were at one point a big player, who are making some nice devices, but appear to be struggling to get market share. So where does Motorola fit generally in the, in the ladder of phone manufacturers? I think to add some context to John there, let's look at and focus on the UK market. Okay then. So I'd say regarding the UK market, I would put Motorola now in a solid third position. So Apple, by perception, um, will be classed as first. I don't personally agree with that because I think that the value these companies add to their products goes in segments in terms of affordability as well. That's a key element. Um, let's not forget many people can't afford an Apple device, no matter how much they want one. Um, and that, to me, is, is, is a non-starter if you're looking at it from a technology point of view for, for many people. And Motorola have the, the opposite approach to the product. So, yeah, Apple first, Samsung second, Motorola third. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the next two years Samsung were knocked out of its position. So in what Gary was saying there, we, if we're looking at the UK market, uh, we've seen Apple had a head start with the iPhone, and they were definitely undisputed in terms of quality and what they were producing up to, I'd say, the iPhone 5. Uh, but then the Android market was exploding at the time. Samsung had the head start amongst the, Samsung, uh, amongst the Android OEMs, while Sony was still in pivoting modes, and they were still dealing with the killing of the Sony Ericsson branding. Meanwhile, HTC had the line share just before Samsung went boom. So as the Android market grew, Samsung had the line share. When it started to mature, suddenly other players matured themselves, such as Motorola, and have gone from 0 to 10% market share and hurt Samsung seriously in the, in the process. So the market segment that used to be dominated by Samsung with the Samsung Galaxy Ace and the Ace 2 shortly after that, um, was iterated by the original Moto G and then the Moto E. Samsung's low-end devices, which were their cash cows in terms of getting customers on board, uh, suddenly dried up because of Motorola. And to a lesser extent, uh, Huawei with their low-end devices sold through Carphone Warehouse and uh, Phones for You at the time. So... In the UK market, I would see Motorola as a solid third, potentially going into second at some point. Sony is on a slightly different track because they've taken more of a an Apple approach to it and in the process almost excluded a whole segment of the market of mm -hmm. customers from them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. a fair assessment. Um, when Sorry, when you mentioned... Uh, the Galaxy Ace there, I kind of had a mini stroke. Um, <laughs> I should have. I physically should have. Yeah, I, I do feel a little bit sick. Um, okay. But but no, I think uh, the Moto G, I think what you were saying there about the Moto G stealing the thunder from them, it definitely did. Um, and if I was asked by your typical any man on the street, the Moto G would be my recommendation. But of course, of course, gents, um, the Motorola event wasn't the only launch event this week, was it? Um, and we've seen the OnePlus 2 formally announced. Yes. With, with surprise, surprise, another invite ordering system behind it. 
So in able to actually buy the bloody thing, you have to request an invite to purchase. Is that right? Indeed. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, do you guys think that was a successful tactic for the, for the one plus one? Do you think by, by making it a little bit scarce, it added a bit of intrigue and, and interest? Um, or do you think it just completely backfired because no one ended up buying one in the end? I was very, very intrigued with the first generation of the one plus one, and I jumped on the bandwagon as soon as I could. So I believe I got one in early October last year. And at the time was very happy with it. I was using it. I was even going into the forums and reporting bugs that I had found. And I'm quite proud to say that I found one that no one else had found. But apart from that, uh, the OnePlus was a great device. And in a way, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to the non-major brands and what's coming out of China. Uh, so... One plus, I got one. I shared invites. Uh, a lot of people around the office in, uh, at Skyscanner were sharing invites. And it's been a very, very popular device uh, amongst many people. Uh, almost in the same way the Honor 6 Plus has. So it's a slightly different thing. Um, I, I'm sure it massages the ego of many hipsters who don't want to be seen holding iPhones or Samsung devices while still delivering great value at a, a more affordable price. With the OnePlus 2, I think I've lost that interest because I've also been investigating more of the Asian suppliers of devices, whether they're OEMs or ODMs. So I have a Meizu M2 Note, which is a 5.5-inch octa-core device, which sells for around about £100. And I don't really see much value in spending almost £300 on a OnePlus 2 when for the same price I can get a Moto X Play or a Meizu M2 or maybe even a Meizu MX5. So I was, it was very interesting. It was, they had a lot of innovation in terms of it's the first product announcement made in, or through Google Cardboard in virtual reality. But I'm not too excited about it, and I wouldn't be ordering one. How about you, Gary? Unlike yourself, I didn't buy into the hype of the original OnePlus One. Um, it, the invite system put me off, really. Um, I've followed it since then, and I've been on the fence of buying one several times. However, uh, when this new one came out... Um, I have to say, I, I have put myself on the reservation list, um, and I I think I might get one. However, I'm not completely sold yet. There's a couple of things that uh, were missing from the spec list that uh, concerned me slightly. Number one being no NFC. Now, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but NFC, I'm under the impression, is vital for... Android Pay. So I don't really know how they're planning on doing that without NFC unless they are planning on making an aftermarket available an NFC backplate because there is two Pogo pins on the back of the phone, which it is claimed are to identify what back cover you have on. Personally, yeah. I don't see that as legitimate. I think they're going to bring an NFC as an optional extra. Second, it doesn't have Qualcomm Quick Charge because of the USB 3 implementation. But the question is, is that going to be US 3, USB 3 quick charge, or is it just USB 3 for the sake of having USB 3 for working on USB, T, USB 2 tech? Sorry, that's my main two concerns. Yeah. Um, John, do you have anything on that one? Um, I mean, I'm, I've, got, I've got the um, the specs here, and it, it looks... A very nice phone. I mean, there's there's, there's no question there. It's you know, got a reasonable battery. It's got what looks to have de decent cameras, plenty of storage, nice 1080p screen, fast processor. But I just I'm just struggling to get my head around why why we've got this strange invite system and and what that adds. It, it feels like a gimmick. And then you've got the 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 cardboard launch that had that feels like an, another gimmick. And when you start to kind of add too many gimmicks on top of each other, you kind of wonder 
are, are they getting desperate? What are they hiding? Isn't the phone capable of selling itself? You know, and perhaps that just kind of sums up the lack of interest that they're having to build the hype themselves using alternative methods. Yes. Well, I can understand from a business standpoint why they're doing that. Now, OnePlus claim to be a scrap, scrappy startup. Um, more than one rumor has pointed us in the direction of seeing that they are funded and supported in their manufacturing processes by OPPO. That's OPO with a double P. They do this because they claim that with the first ge- generation or the one plus one, they did not know what the real demand was. So the invite system allowed them to book manufacturing capacity and do it without losing a lot of money because it reduced their business risk. Uh, with the OnePlus 2, they're doing that as well because they're not sure that their customers from the OnePlus 1 will upgrade to OnePlus 2 or that any of their other um, competitors' customers will switch to OnePlus 2. To them, this is a bit of a leap in the dark, and so the invite system manages, gives them the opportunity to gauge exactly how many devices they'll sell so that they don't over or under manufacture. Their issue with the OnePlus One was they had created this hype, and even their best predictions of what they were going to need to manufacture was not enough, and that's why it was only a few months ago they actually removed the invite system. So from a business standpoint, I understand why they're doing it. It does add a bit of the, oh, exclusivity, I've got a OnePlus One. You can only get this on invite. La-di-da-di-da. But um, I think that's that's something that's passing now. Because if they've got 500,000 devices at launch, that's a good 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 start. You're all, all, all with, already at half a million devices. Yeah, um, so I'm having a look at the... Um... The reservation site at the moment, uh, the invite reservation list. Um, and I, I got in fairly early, um, and I did the article about it yesterday, which I, I put my link um, that you can go on and reserve on. You mentioned 500,000 devices. Now, their reservation list is currently, let me just do a wee refresh here. The reservation list is currently sitting at 777,000. 804 okay. and i am so that, currently in position 12,648 congratulations i'm not entirely sure how because when i joined i was on 63,000 so clearly people have been clicking on that link yes not not only that um obviously retailers will be wanting to do that and they'll have found a way of automating the sign up process and one plus will have seen that cancel the validation of those invites. What proportion of the people who has requested an invite will actually go ahead and convert and actually buy them is something else we should be asking and would be yeah. very, very interesting because some people might be registering for an invite to then sell the invite on eBay or Indeed. AliExpress or anywhere else. So it will be very interesting to see how that works out for them. And on that note, gents... I will say thank you very much for your time tonight. It's uh, that's the end of tonight's podcast, and start with uh, Gary. If Gary, if, if people want to contact you, how can they do so? Uh, they can get hold of me on my Twitter account, which is at Ben Grendon, and they can also check out any of my posts on the CoolSmartphone.com website and email me through the About Us section or just post in any of the comments. Excellent. And Matt, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Well, they can read my uh, output on coolsmartphone.com, including this week's live blog from the Motorola event. Later this week... fantastic, by the way. Great, thank you very much. As uh, as well as that, I will be writing a full write-up on that and a review of the Moto G third generation very soon. Uh, If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Todoleo on Twitter and plus Matteo Doni on Google+. And that's all we have time for on this week's Cool Smartphone Podcast. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to all future podcasts following the instructions on our website. Don't forget, you can check out our website at www.coolsmartphone.com 
or you can follow us on Twitter at Cool Smartphone. My name's John, and you can follow me on Twitter as well at Grain Geek John. Until next time, I wish you all a very happy week. Bye bye.